Hello, hello everyone. Welcome, welcome to, what is it? Wednesday? Wednesday version, a uh, Wednesday session. <laughs> I'm working with a lot of versions of stuff online right now. Excuse my words sometimes. But welcome to Wednesday's um, service dog prep. I'm so glad to see you guys here today. I'm so happy to be with you. My name is Caitlin Bird. I am the owner of Caitlin's Animal Training as well as the lead trainer for the program, The Unstoppable Service Dog. And if you guys are learning, to be here and learn about training your service dog, you are on the right video. I am so excited to get started today. So before we get started, let me pull up my notes here really quick because we have a lot of stuff to go over, okay? So if, you're, if you already have your newly updated workbook, okay, if you're not familiar, it looks like this. Okay, if you don't have your workbook, reach out to me. If you have an old workbook from previous workshops, reach out to me because I update this one for every single workshop, all right? So we are on day three, and that means we get to learn about the fun stuff. People tend to get really excited about day three because this is when we really start having the fun. All right, so we've laid our foundation we've talked about what you should be looking for in a puppy or in a service dog if you're not choosing a puppy hi liz or elizabeth or beth is it beth i think you like your the uh the nickname beth right i saw it in the document you sent me earlier uh yesterday hi beth nice to see you here so um yeah this is the meat and potatoes we are getting right into the meat and potatoes here and um I, before we do that, you know, I kind of want to go over some of the common mistakes that people make before, you know, they start the training process. And believe it or not, it has a lot to do with what we talked about previously, right? We're talking about getting your team together. Who's on your team, right? There's four people on your team. Number one, your healthcare provider, right? Number two, your breeder. Number three, your veterinarian, especially, especially if you plan on doing mobility work with your service dog. And number four, of course, is your trainer, right? So those are the four people you need to have on your team to help you raise and train your service dog for the next two years of their lives, okay? So some of the most common mistakes again we've kind of already touched on this in the previous workshops if you've been watching those videos right number one is that they get the puppy first okay so this is this is your list this is this is the page that we're on today top four common mistakes number one you get your puppy before you do your research and before you get your team together and before you are really really prepared and do your research and read your books on the process okay that is mistake number one and believe me so many people make this mistake hey girl hey how you doing beth nice to see you here i'm gonna take a drink real quick you got you got you gotta hydrate especially when you're talking quite a bit you gotta hydrate right so hope is here with me today she's being such a good girl i promise you she's not always like this but every time you guys are tuning in she's just passed out on the couch over there being a really good girl <laughs> As I'm saying this, she's like grunting, so tired. <laughs> but yeah, we had a really good um, exercise this morning. That's another, that's another thing, you know, service dogs in order to do their work the best have to get daily exercise, right? So we went um, off with her long line at a local park. She honestly doesn't need the long line. She could be fine off leash, but you know, she, we're still pretty new to each other, like living 24 seven together. I've known this dog for two years, but we've never lived together. So I, this is like the third week that we're on and I'm still making sure I know her and figure her out, right? Hi, Phil, nice to see you here. Great to have you. I'm sorry to hear about what's been going on. That's, that's crazy, that's real crazy. Um, okay, so that's mistake number one. You get the puppy before you're ready, before you do your research. Mistake number two, okay? Well, this feeds into, this feeds into mistake number one you don't choose your team first right so you have the four people on your team we just covered that mistake number three guess what i swear nobody does this why doesn't anybody do this it's not keeping a progress calendar 
Okay. So if you want to make sure, yeah, you have two years to train your dog. It seems like a huge amount of time. But guess what happens when people have all that time to train their dog? They quickly fall off the wagon. They say, oh, we can do that later. Oh, we're not going to make that a priority, right? No, you need that time for the two years to train your dog. And your dog needs that time to grow up and to learn the routines and build that focus around in other environments. Hi, Yaya. So nice to see you here. I got someone coming into the group. I'm not sure. Did, did someone send, send them here? Because they didn't, they didn't mention anybody and they, they, got, they gave like some very wishy-washy answers. So I'm not sure if that's somebody, uh, what of you guys sent. Um, just let me know if you guys have sent anybody to the group. Because I definitely got somebody coming. All right. So that is mistake number three. So a progress calendar. Okay. I don't have my progress calendar here with me. Because I'm in the middle of switching over from that and relying more heavily on Google. Okay. So this, this is technically my progress calendar right now, okay? I use um, Google Calendar, and I actually, you can print it off every single day. This is my schedule. This is my schedule today. Look at how busy I am, okay? I'm back to back to back to back to back, right? I have stuff going on. And that's how it should be with you and your dog. You need to figure out a way that you can keep track and keep pushing towards your goals. Okay, because part of having a service dog and being a successful trainer and a successful team is knowing how to make those goals happen. Okay, and if you don't know how to make those goals happen, I actually have some great recommended, uh, some books that I recommend. And I just posted in the group my recommended reading list. Okay, and in that recommended leading list, it's a PDF document. You guys can download it for free. You don't have to reach out for me or anything. It's all available in the group right now. And again, I just uploaded it. And in that PDF is actually a link at the bottom where you can click to see the exact books that I have for, that I recommend for brand new service dog trainers, okay? So one of them is about building habit. And building habit is extremely important, right? Building habit is crazy important. Because if you can't build habit, then you can't build goals. If you can't build goals, you can't have a service dog. All right. Um, and number, oh yeah. Mistake number four that people make mistakes is they rush into tasks too early, too quickly. Oftentimes when people really, and this can really, in the end, this can end up hurting your dog and this can end up hurting your training. Okay. So for example, She's being so good. So for example, for those of you who might need mobility work, people like to rush into mobility and they don't learn how to do it the right way. And if they don't learn how to do it the right way, you actually have physical complications. Excuse me. Okay. You actually have physical complications that you can give to your dog. You can have them have slipped elbows. You can cause hip dysplasia if you're, God forbid, you're doing it on your dog's hips, right? You can cause back issues, okay? So if you don't know how to do certain tasks the right way, you can really end up harming your dog. Another example is, I don't know why, but sometimes people really struggle with teaching their dog to bring them things on cue and only on cue, <laughs> okay? Um, I know Ingrid for the longest time was struggling with hope, not only to pick things up. Oh my gosh, she's a Labrador, right? She would pick things up, but she wouldn't hold on to them and she wouldn't walk around with them with you, right? And she was really having a hard time with it. Not only that, but when she started training, pick up, give it to me, go find the keys, whatever, right? Hope actually started to be like, okay, so I bring you anything and I get a treat, right? And now I'm currently in the process of breaking this bad habit where she's just going to grab something and start playing keep away with you, right? And I'm like, that's the last thing on earth that you need a service dog to be doing is grabbing stuff and start playing keep away and then tearing it up in front of your face because Hope will tear it up. Um, the first week and a half she was here, I had a nice box of tissues right here on my desk. She grabbed them and she tore them up. And I'm like, I come into the room and I'm just like, 
what is this? <laughs> what is this? <laughs> um, so it, it, I, I feel like it's happening less often. Okay. It's about three weeks in. I feel like it's happening less often. So, um, but that's because I know how to prevent those behaviors from occurring. And honestly, you know, if she was my dog, it wouldn't have developed in the first place, right? But you need to know, okay, when should you be introducing those skill sets of, okay, this is a task, you need to go grab something from me or close the door or, you know, pull me up or, right? Because God forbid your dog's gonna start offering, okay, I need to pull on you and tug on you. And they, then they think it's a game. Right. So there are a lot of things down the road that can really set up roadblocks and prevent you from getting to where you need to be and making you think, oh, my God, this can't be a service dog. No, you just probably introduced tasks too early. OK, so keep that in mind. All right. So the next thing on here that we have, I have a whole list of puppy house manners. OK, so the first thing I have on here is crate training. Let's talk about crate training. Every service dog needs to be crate trained. Okay, hands down. Now that being said, if you are getting your dog from a breeder that uses puppy culture, you shouldn't have any issues with the crate. You should not have issues with the crate, okay? If your breeder understands it and has been doing it for a while, they have separated each puppy into their own crate and they will have learned how to be alone and not freak out and they really, really love their crate. OK, so that's one reason why I really love breeders that practice puppy culture, because Elizabeth, it's kind of like what you said earlier. I think yesterday it's kind of like bomb proofing, right? It's really kind of like bomb proofing. That's what puppy culture is. Manding. Manding is really important. What is manding? OK, for those of you with autistic children, raise your hands down in the comments below. Have you heard of the word manding? Uh, Elizabeth says, do you recommend a playpen space around the crate? Yes, absolutely. Hi, Christina. Nice to see you here. How are you doing, girl? I hope you're doing all right. Um, so what is manding? Those of you with autistic children, have you heard of manding before? Okay, I'm going to skip that one for now. I'm going to wait for you guys for some comments to come in. And I'll explain to you what it is. Settling. All right. So. When it comes to training your service dog, all of this stuff that I'm talking to you about right now is everything you need to make sure your dog has down before going in to obedience. Okay, I'm gonna say this again. This list that you have in your workbook right here is everything that your dog needs to have down before going into obedience. Why? Why? Because this is basic, right? This is the foundation that you're building your house on. You've, you know, cleared out the area, you have flattened the ground, you're starting to put in your cement, and you need that cement to settle. Okay, this is you putting that foundation so that you can then build the house on top of it. Okay, and you can't build a house on top you can't go into obedience before you have this stuff down. Why? Because if you don't get this stuff down, it's going to start bleeding into the rest of your training and affect everything else. And it's not going to be easy for you. Okay. And I guarantee you it's not going to be easy. Okay. Elizabeth says she has not heard of manding. So let me tell you what manding is. Number one, in usually a lot of the more severe autistic cases, Maybe they're nonverbal, right? Manding is when you teach a child or a dog to ask politely in a specific way, okay? It's like demanding, but it's polite, right? That's manding. So the way that puppies are taught how to mand, and by the way, puppy culture, puppy culture teaches this, puppies are taught how to mand by sitting, looking up at you quietly, politely, and calmly. Wow, guys, wow, right? How many of your friends do you know that have dogs that jump up all over you? Especially when you come through the front door, right? If that, and dogs jump up because they want something. They want to get 
attention. They want your pets and your love. So they have to jump up to try to see you and say hi, right? Can you imagine having a puppy come into your home and if they want something, all they have to do is sit down and look at you? Mind blown, right? This is why, this is another reason why I recommend finding a breeder that knows and does puppy culture, okay? Because that's what they do. They don't just jump up and go everywhere, okay? It makes it so much easier. You guys have no idea. It makes it so much easier. And for you guys being first-time service dog owners and trainers, you are going to love this, okay? And it's going to help you hit the ground and run with it. Okay, or right, you, you can start at baseline where you just get a puppy from a regular old breeder. You can start above blade baseline where you get a puppy from a puppy culture breeder, or you can start below baseline, probably getting a dog from a shelter or one that already has some bad habits, doesn't have good house manners, and you're going to have to spend more and extra frustrating time by yourself trying to fix these issues. Okay not very fun not very easy and you're going to have a lot of doubts and think you're going to have to wash your dog pretty early on okay uh the next thing is if you're getting a puppy mouthiness okay you have to make sure that you have your mouthiness down keep constantly redirecting to appropriate items um kong training so if you guys have requested the dr ian dunbar book how to, what to do before you get your puppy. He talks about how you can actually automatically train your dog to prefer and learn to chew on an appropriate item called a Kong. So if you guys don't know what a Kong is, actually I have one on the floor behind me. Hope, Hope, can you wake up? Hi, Hope, touch. Nice job, can you go get it? Go get the Kong. Can you go get your toy? Nice job, breeder. Nice, thank you. Good girl. So Hope just brought me her Kong. I'm going to give her a treat for that because she was sound asleep and I woke her up. <laughs> there you go. Good girl. Doing real good. Okay. All right, go to your bed. Go back to your bed. Thank you. Okay, so if you guys haven't seen this before, this is a Kong, okay? Kongs are amazing. Yes, Kongs are amazing, Liz. Do you guys have a Kong? Elizabeth, how many Kongs do you have at your home? How many Kongs do you have? Christina, have you heard of Kongs? Who else do I have on here? I think it's Christina. And Yaya, I think you're still here, right, Yaya? Do you have Kongs? Do you know Kongs? What is this? So in the book, in the free book, what to do um, before you get your puppy by Dr. Ian Dunbar, he goes over what Kongs are and how to use them. And he says that food bowls, Christina says, yes. How many Kongs do you have, Christina? Let me know. Um, he says that food bowls are the most useless thing you can buy for your dog. If you buy a food bowl, you are wasting money. However, when you buy a Kong, especially for puppies, Oh, there's stuff on here. Yeah. Ew. What have you been doing to this hoe? <laughs> However, when you have a Kong, you can put food and your kibble in your dog's Kong. And then it becomes a toy and they can learn to chew an appropriate item rather than your shoes, rather than your hands, rather than your clothes or your hair, right? So constantly redirecting to toys and using a Kong to tire their jaw out is really, really awesome to help create a calmer dog too, okay? Elizabeth says, Capone had four. He was champion chewer. Yeah, honestly, I mean, you can see kind of, kind of what Hope's done to this Kong, right? She's got a lot of teeth marks in here. Um, but I mean, it, it's huge. It's also super thick material. Like this is, this is really heavy material. I can hardly squeeze it, right? So, I mean, they've got some powerful jaws and this can really easily tire them out. Christina says three, one for treats. I put peanut butter in it and then freeze it. And one, he just carries it around. Oh, that's so cute. Yeah, there, I have a couple smaller ones around here that I was using for Ollie, um, but and they're about this big. And she just likes to kind of carry those around. Yeah, we I can use that. 
I've used that for like smaller treats too, but yeah, all the different sizes can help with a lot. However, your dog's meals should primarily be coming out of here, especially if they're a puppy, to make sure that you can redirect them onto what's appropriate to chew, all right? Capone actually destroyed one in two days. Yeah, you have to get the Black Kong when they're really strong super chewers like that, uh, Beth. All right, um, so we talked about uh, mouthiness. Oh, did I, I kind of went out, skipped over settling a little bit. The one, one looks like Santa. Oh, poor Santa. <laughs> so I kind of skipped over settling a little bit, okay? So settling is when you teach a dog to lay down and just relax and chill for a few hours. I'm gonna take another drink. All right, that's what settling is. And I swear to God, right, I'm on Instagram, I'm on YouTube, I'm watching these young handlers who have never really professionally trained an animal, animal before and now they're trying to train their own service dogs. I swear, nobody knows how to do a settle. None of these dogs know how to do a settle. They know how to do a prolonged downstay, but oftentimes that's only after they've resulted to shock collars, e-collars, okay? It's all, it's all electrical. It's all stimulation that hurts, okay? And they end up proofing these behaviors. Proofing means to like, the dog doesn't, do something unless you tell it to. Okay, that's proofing. So they've proofed their downstay by using these shock collars and saying, okay, if you move, you're gonna get zapped. And believe me, it works. It's real strong. It works for a really strong downstay. However, they forgot to do settling. And what settling is, the way I teach settling, let me show you real quick my settling setup right here. So for Hope, she's got her settle setup. She's got her bed and she has a four foot tether. And when your puppies are young, when your puppies are young, you use that four foot tether every single day. And you give them their Kong, you give them their chew toys and you teach them to stay in one place and be comfortable staying in one place for a prolonged period of time. Okay, that's what settling is. And that's what I do with my puppies. And then you never have to result. My gosh, I, look, I feel like I'm really crooked and you guys might, I don't know, get, a, get some tilted head <laughs> in there. Um, so, you know, especially for dogs that might be a little bit bigger, I'm sorry, a little bit smaller, they might have some more energy. You need to start this when they're very young and you need to make it a very, very pleasant and happy experience. And you also need to be shaping calm behavior as you're doing this. And there's a specific way in my program that I teach people how to shape these calm behaviors. However, again, I keep mentioning, I see all these people on Instagram, I see all these people on YouTube, and I'm, I'm just shaking my head because there is a better way, but they're doing the best that they can with the knowledge that they have, right? They've gone out this by their, themselves and or maybe they picked the wrong trainer. Unfortunately, there's a lot of trainers who advocate for that too, right? It's not just the handlers doing it, it's trainers advocating for it too because they don't know these things, right? And I've told you before, dog training is a completely unregulated field. You have to be careful who you go to because you could end up destroying your dog, all right? Um, so, settle, mouthiness, calm training. Got some comments in here. I missed Mouthy. Gunner gets Mouthy mainly to go bye-bye, but he settles after a few minutes of fetch and then he's ready. Yeah, and sometimes, you know, you have to like deal with what you got, right? You find a way to make it work. Elizabeth says, we called it hold. Capone could hold for almost three hours when we rehomed him. Wow, that's awesome, Elizabeth. Yeah. So um, especially, yeah, no, that that's that's fantastic. I love it. So let's see, what do we got here? Kong training, tether training. Tether training goes in hand in hand with the settle training, okay? Um, they're very, very complimentary. Before you actually hook your dog onto the tether, they can have a negative reaction to it, right? They, they, they have an opposition reflex and if they're tied down, they can freak out and then they can get hurt. 
So there is a proper way to introduce the tether in order to get those nice, beautiful, happy, and long-lasting settle behaviors, okay? You are so cute. <laughs> Hope's peeking up through my, my legs are crossed, and she's peeking her head up through the middle. She's like, hey, what's up? <laughs> she's so cute. All right. Um, the other things I have on here are go to your bed. Again, very, very complimentary to settle and te tether training. Uh, door greetings. Don't tell me you have to go out now. Girlfriend, you're going to have to wait. Yeah, you're going to have to wait right there. Thank you very much. Good job. Um, door greetings. A lot of people struggle with door greetings for their dogs. Um, can't have them jumping up, can't have them going crazy. And again, that can also go to your bed can also be very, very helpful with door greetings. Okay. Um, visitors, what to do with visitors. A lot of people get overwhelmed because they don't know how to handle when people come in. And there's actually a whole series in my online training program where I teach people, Hey, the, this is the outline. This is your blueprint on how to handle visitors coming in, right? And how you can make sure that they're following your guidelines. Okay. And a lot of people, they miss this in their training. Again, this is your foundation you need to be setting before you even start obedience. Right? I hope. Excuse me. Come here. Come here, sweetie. You can't hang out with me all day. You have to go find Scott to go outside, you know. You do. Like, go to your bed. Okay. Um, what else? Prevention of separation anxiety. So um, for breed, it, maybe you found a breeder that, you know, they have a couple successful, there's a couple other dogs that have been successful service dogs. Okay. And maybe they said, okay, listen, what you want to find, and we learned this the other day in the previous workshop, was this Tuesday? I think this was yesterday. And we were talking about, you know, what kind of characteristics make a good service dog. Especially if you're looking at it for puppies. Well, number one, handler focus, right? Well, guess what comes along with handler focus? What comes along with handler focus is the ability, the higher chance of separation anxiety being developed in that dog, okay? So when you leave the room, there's crying, whining, barking, pacing. Sometimes they lose their minds and they're peeing over everything, okay? So... That is what can happen. And my question to you is, do you know the steps to prevent separation anxiety from happening? Okay, this is what happened with Athena, the German Shepherd dog that I was telling you about yesterday, where the husband, he's a combat vet, he has severe PTSD, he wanted a German Shepherd um, service dog and he wanted to train it himself. And they literally, all these four mistakes they made in the first month they had that dog, all four of these mistakes, they made mistakes. And by the time they came to me, they said, okay, listen, we know she can't be a service dog. However, she's a complete monster now because we've just put it off and we've put it off and we've been busy working. We've put it off. Dog has separation anxiety. The dog doesn't have good obedience. The dog freaks out when mom leaves within five feet of her, right? And now we're taking like a year to backtrack to get her at least to baseline, right? Because they started here at baseline and then as the years went on, it got worse and worse and worse and worse. And now we have to start backtracking, okay? Now we have to start backtracking. Okay, the other one, the last one I wanna cover is your dog has to be good around other pets and animals. Just because you live on a farm doesn't mean you can't have a service dog. Honestly, living on a farm is a fantastic place to practice around your distractions. It is absolutely fantastic. If your dog can settle around goats and sheep and horses and they're running around doing their thing, guys, that's a perfect environment to do it around, okay? All right, so now we are jumping in to basic obedience. This is what the page looks like. If you guys are keeping track and coming along. Uh, OT slightly? What's OT, Christina? 
Christina says, I have been not allowing Gunnar to follow me around the house to help him learn to be without me. Okay, that's that's one step to do it, right? Um, there's definitely a more of an in-depth training plan because sometimes that stuff can backfire and I don't like to recommend anything over the internet until I know you and your situation better because the problem with internet advice, internet advice is that if someone doesn't do a full assessment and doesn't know your situation front to back, back to front, you're probably going to make the situation a lot worse. And you're going to be like, I tried this and someone told that and I tried this and you're just going to try all these little things and you're not going to have that coach to lead you through. And then you're going to end up crashing, right? And making it worse. And time after time after time, I see this happening. Okay. And that, that's when people say, oh, you know what? I should have just called you in the first place. Now we have a dog that's 10 times worse than what he was. <laughs> and I'm like, great, thanks. Thanks. I guess I'm going to have you three times longer than uh, what I would have had you initially. Okay. So uh, the milking barn, you have a milking barn? Hope. I know. I know. I know. All right. So obedience. A typical obedience class lasts about six weeks and covers the following behaviors. Hello. Do you, you really need to go to the bathroom. Okay, guys, I am going to leave you guys real quick. I'm going to rotate you towards the birds. You can see the, oh, you can see my wall over there where it's nice and pretty. And I'm going to go let Hope out to go take a potty break real quick because she didn't go earlier. You ready to go? Come on, let's go. Let's go hurry. Can you go hurry? Yeah, you do. Let's go. Here's the lady of the hour. Hope, what you doing? You take a tinkle? Yeah, I know. Good job. Thank you guys for sticking with me. So glad that you guys are still here. Thank you, Christina, for understanding. All right, so obedience classes. Typically, they last six weeks, okay? 
Now, again, before you even think about going to an obedience class, you have to set the foundation behaviors, right? You need to start those foundation behaviors and make sure your dog has under, yeah, I gotta go when you gotta go. I know, I know. Um, okay, so the typical behaviors that they cover in an obedience class during the six weeks. Come, sit, down, stay, leave it, loose leash walking. Did I miss anything? Intro to sex, intro to like a 10 second stay. But yeah, th those are the basic behaviors that they cover in a class, okay? And yeah, yeah, thank you again for coming in so early in the morning. That's awesome. Again, great way to start your morning though, talking about dogs. There's no better way. Um, yep, down from a sitter stand. That's kind of known as a puppy push-up. Um, and the thing is, you, just because, right, just because you go to a basic obedience class. Again, this is advanced, right? You should have all the other behaviors down pat first. Just because you go to a basic obedience class does not mean that your dog can perform these behaviors in every single environment. What do I mean by that? Why if you go to a dog class and you're teaching come in a PetSmart store, right? And you're paying $250 for a six week class, right? Why if you're teaching come in that class, can you not go to a giant off-leash dog park and tell your dog to come and they'll do it. Anybody know why? Anybody understand that concept? What is it? There, there's actually a name for it. And I'll give you guys a name, but I want you guys to think about this. Why is it? Okay, we've learned all these things. Hello. What happened? Can I help you? Um, why can't you transfer it over there? Anybody want to Gander a guess, okay? So birds, however, I've noticed Titan, he's a smart little guy. He's my little blue parrot, he's about this big. Okay, he's five years old now. He'll live to be in his 20s. And Titan can actually do this. If I taught Titan down here to fly to me on cue, he can actually do it outside in a covered aviary. Really impressive for an animal. Why can't dogs do that? Christina says, Gunnar does good at the store. When I ask him to wait, he will stand by my leg, but not sit. I would guess they get excited. Elizabeth says, associating a behavior with the location. <laughs> Christina, yes. So the short, there's, a, there's, there's one word that sums all this up. It's called generalizing. Dogs are known to be bad at generalizing behavior. If they learn it on carpet, if they learn a sit on carpet, you have to reteach them all over again on a smooth surface, like tile, okay? Why? It's just, it feels different. There's different mechanics to it. They have to speed up or slow down to adjust for what they're standing on. Okay, and even if you go in, into grass, right? Wow, why won't your dog do a, do a down in grass when you wake up first thing in the morning to go give your dog a walk? Grass is probably wet. That's something else that you have to teach them to do. Cold butt, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, there's all these different things that you actually have to teach your dog step by step, one at a time to do, right? Uh, Beth says like why potty pads are not awesome for potty training. Depends what you want to do. If you have a dog that needs to stay in a certain place for hours and hours on end, maybe you're doing competitions. A lot of people train their dogs to go potty on potty pads. However, if you're not doing that, potty pads are probably not for you, <laughs> right? Probably not for you. Um, so that's why. Okay, that's why if you learn all this stuff in a basic obedience class or an advanced obedience class, it's not gonna transfer elsewhere unless you practice there and you practice and you go back to luring and you go, or you go back to shaping, right? And that's the thing. Dogs will get excited, right? Dogs will get excited when they're in a new place. Not all the time. Of course, if you have a breed with puppy culture, they're a lot less likely to get excited because they've done that exposure to places, okay? And if you've done puppy raising the right way and socializing the right way, 
they get that exposure to places, it's not as exciting. Okay, but again, you have about a 14 to 16 week window to get that done when you're a puppy. After 14, 16 weeks, it's 10 million times harder to work on that excitement. And you're gonna be stuck doing it a much longer time. Okay, and there's, there's things in my online program that I go over where, you know, there are those guidelines, there are those stepping stones for how, for you to be, to be able to go through, okay? Oh, this is dehydrating me so much. All right, so advanced obedience classes, they also tend to last about six weeks. In the advanced obedience classes, they should be covering a prolonged settle, so a longer downstay, an automatic leave it, natural loose sleep walk walking. So instead of saying leave it, you should the dog should be able to leave it automatically, okay? Natural loose leash walking, so stuff you would do out throughout your normal day, so a longer distance on the loose leash walk. You guys can scroll back in the group a little bit and watch me and Hope practicing our loose leash walking. I really wanna get like some sort of camera where we can, where you guys can see like her distance and how many steps we're taking. Hi, baby girl. I think you're just bored now. She's putting her chin um, <laughs> on my leg. But, Hi, Cassandra, nice to see you here again. Um, she's putting her chin on my knee, letting her know she, you know, that she wants something. Normally that means she's go potty, but I know she's already done that. So she probably wants to train. I swear to God, she sleeps and trains, sleep and trains, sleep and train with this dog. Um, I totally would have picked out a different dog for Ingrid. And thankfully she's starting the right, with the right puppy this time. Um, okay. So prolonged settle, automatic leave it, natural loose leash walking, polite greetings again. Okay, this is something that they cover when the dogs already, you know, have had their shots and they can go to class. But uh, polite greetings when you get a puppy culture puppy, they just sit down, they look at you nicely for that attention, okay? They shouldn't be jumping up over you constantly for all these things. If they want something, they should be manding for it. Um, sit down and stay. Right, and they're going to do more advanced concepts with sits down and stays. I like to start with hand signals and usually in the advanced classes, I start to use verbal signals because us as humans, we are terrible at repeating ourselves. I cannot tell you, we are so bad at repeating ourselves over and over and over again. And I nip that right in the bud and I say, nope, you guys are using hand signals and the only word you're saying is your dog's name. We're not saying sit down, stay, because you're gonna start repeating yourself because you're brand new to training and we're not having that here, <laughs> right? We want your dog to listen to you the first time you say a cue, okay? And of course, it can take up to a year and a half for a dog to perform all these behaviors in many, many environments, okay? So I wanna go over these a little bit. This is very important on this page this is the stuff that when I came into the dog training field so I haven't been to, I haven't been dog training all my life okay believe it or not when I was growing up I only had one dog and that was probably only for a few months because after a while the dog bit my dad very very lightly and my parents put it down traumatic for me because I was at school and I came home and there was no dog left um, and of course I blamed my dad because he didn't even have a puncture wound so I thought he was lying um, but anyways, aside from that, right, this is what makes the difference. This is the difference between somebody call them, calling themselves a trainer and someone who deals with behavior, okay? Oh, where's Scott? Go find Scott. Where is he? He's not in the gecko tank. Go find Scott. Closer, getting warm. Hope, go find Scott. Where is he? Where's Scott? Go get him, he's upstairs. Go. Go get him, he's upstairs. <laughs> Good Lord. Um, all right, so behavior theory and dog knowledge. All right, the following is not required, but it is strongly encouraged. Hope, give me that. Bring it here. Bring it here. Bring it here. Drop it. You grab it again, you spat it out. You, you just, Thank you. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you should have seen how she spat this little pebble out. She like rocketed it out. I didn't know dogs could do that. 
Um, okay, so behavior theory, right? When I came out of, I haven't, I haven't been training dogs my entire life. I originally started in the zoological field, okay? And when I was younger, I used to go to all these conferences where the top trainers from around the world would come to, and they would lecture on the behaviors that they taught, and they were always very impressive behaviors. I remember this one uh, topic where this one particular trainer was given an entire aviary under his care. And he said, you know what? I want to do something. This is something he came upon by himself. And he has over 30 birds in that aviary that he can call down specifically with a specific whistle in order to get fed. And it's a free flight aviary, right? That I will always remember it made my jaw drop. And I believe he won like behavior of the year award for, for those behaviors that he taught these birds. And, you know, coming from that background and coming from that history, I know that if you understand behavior theory, you can train any animal, any animal, including people, including children, including your spouse, including your coworkers, including your boss to an extent, right? And that empowered me so much. So when I came into the dog training field, right, I worked with everything from alpacas to zebras. I went into the zoological field after um, completing my degree. And then I ended up wanting to start my own business for dogs. And when I came into the dog training community, they said, okay, are you a trainer or are you a behaviorist? And I'm like, what are you talking about? They're the same thing. But no, they're not in the dog training world. I had to learn the hard way because that was one of the most confusing things. I'm like, what are you talking about? If you know behavior, you're a trainer right? And no, 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 no. So in the dog training world, you have people that start learning the tricks right away, but don't necessarily understand the whys and hows of behavior behind it, right? That's what we call a trainer, okay? They don't necessarily know the behavior or the driving mechanics behind it. The other thing that they call is a behaviorist, where you have behavior problems and they come to you and you're supposed to help solve those behavior problems. And I feel like it's unnecessary complications because if you know behavior theory and you train your animals, it's all in one, right? So when you're going out there, when you're going to PetSmart, you're not gonna find a behaviorist, you're gonna find a trainer, okay? You're gonna find somebody who probably doesn't know a lot about service dogs, you're not gonna find somebody here. And honestly, I've had, I've had people come to me where they said, you know, this PetSmart pet co-trainer told them, you know, X, Y, Z, you need to have a certificate, you need to have a vest, you need to register your dog. All that's not true, right? Because they don't have that professional behavior education. And with behavior education, that goes into colleges. And colleges are the ones that are teaching the behavior classes, right? And you have to use your critical thinking skills and you have to do your research and you have to go through these papers, right? And that's not what these trainers have most of the time. The good trainers do do that research. The, do, the good trainers do educate themselves. Most of the time, if you, if you find any of that over at Petco, PetSmart, consider yourself blessed, okay? Because most trainers at Petco, PetSmart go through this really quick, like eight week training program to get them out the door and they say, okay, go teach your classes for us, go make us money. All right, and they're usually college students. I'm sorry, they're usually like high school students. Um, I haven't seen very many college students in doing that. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. All right, with that being said, with that being said, it is very important for you to be an educated consumer. Okay, how do you be an educated consumer? Well, I just uploaded a reading list, a free PDF that you guys can download from the Facebook group. It is my recommended reading list for service dogs. And within that PDF at the very bottom is a link to where you can buy the exact books that I'm recommending to you. Okay, so I only fit, I think I only fit five books on the list, but if you visit the link, there's much, there's many, many more books. 
not not too many more. There's like three or four more books that are on my list for you guys to look over. Um, there's stuff that I've compiled about habits, how to build and maintain long-term habits to make sure that you are successful with your service dog because service dog training is nothing if not a long-term goal and a long-term project, okay? So if you struggled with projects in the past and you know you have, know that this is going to be a book you're going to want to add on to your list, okay? Elizabeth says there's two pet smarts in New York City who have an on-staff behaviorist. That's interesting. I would definitely like to know about more about that because that must just be a New York City thing. Um, generally, in order to call yourself a behaviorist, you have to have a college degree. And I don't see PetSmart ever paying enough to have a person with a college degree on there. So I, I would still take that with a grain of salt and do a little research and see and ask like, okay, what is your education? Where did you go to? Right? Always do your research. Don't just trust people blindly. Okay. Always do your research. Don't trust me blindly. Right? Ask me those questions because that lets me know that you are an engaged, educated consumer. And I love engaged, educated consumers, guys. I love it when you ask me the hard questions. Okay. Please ask me the hard questions. All right. Okay, so um, part of behavior theory and knowledge, I would suggest for you guys to really understand classical and operant conditioning. Oh my God, this sounds so boring, right? Are you thinking that already? Are you thinking that, oh my gosh, classical and operant conditioning, this sounds so dry. Yeah, it can be a little dry. However, there are some great books on the topic or you can take a college class, right? You can sign up for one class and say, hey, I wanna take your behavior theory class. I wanna understand this stuff, right? And, you know, so ideally someone should teach you. Ideally, you should be able to go to a community college and sign up or take a self-college study or a self-study for a college book. One of my favorite college books, and you can get this for cheap, right? So like a, like a typical college class, depending where you're from, they can be anywhere from like, $300, $800, right? Somewhere we're, we're in that range. That's last I checked. That's last when I graduated college, okay? I'm sure it's changed by now. But that's generally the range that you're looking for. However, if you want to self-study, you can grab a book online. And this is on my recommended reading list. It is called uh, Learning and Behavior by Paul Chance. Okay, again, go to the group, download that PDF, go to the link, and it will show you where and what that book looks like and how much it is. Um, there's older versions that you can probably get for 30 bucks. You don't have to pay $800 to take college class. You can self-study, right? You can take your own notes. You can read and you can absorb and you can go look online and Google it, right? Um, you can really d delve into this topic to make sure that you know what you're understanding and... <laughs> When people start throwing, like when trainers are telling you these terms, like positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment, and negative punishment, then you are at least five steps ahead of them. Because I, I guarantee you, most trainers want to get that wrong. Okay, most trainers don't under, even understand the basics of the four quadrants of behavior change. Okay, so you could school them, right? You get these books and you understand it, and you can school them on stuff and be like, no, 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 you think that's negative punishment, but actually it's positive punishment, right? So there's all these kinds of things that you can do to self-study, all right? Um, doggy, the doggy theology and body language. So believe it or not, most dog owners have no idea what their dogs are communicating with them, okay? Why do you think I'm saying that? I want you to pause on that for a minute. I want you to think about that. Yaya yeah, yeah, says, reading is power. Yes, knowledge is so much power. Absolutely. Can you send me the name or write it here so I can look it up later? It's in the group, girlfriend. You can look it up on the group, okay? Just go to service dog prep and you can go into the files section. PDF's right there, okay? <clears throat> so why am I saying most people don't know what their dogs are telling them. Well, first off, if they knew exactly what they were telling them, they wouldn't be shocking their dogs with a shock collar, right? As a main way to train their animal. So 
somebody looks at those dogs and say, oh, how well behaved. I look at those dogs and I say, your dog is freaked out right now. He doesn't want to be here. <laughs> Why is there that difference? Why is there that difference? Because ethology and body language go hand in hand. Okay. So body language can be very, very subtle. Very, very subtle. Okay. And people miss the subtle signs. If I were to ask you guys right now, what does a dog wagging their tail mean? Tell me in the comments. What is that dog feeling? What does a dog wagging their tail mean? I'm going to wait for you guys to answer. What does a wagging tail mean? Elizabeth says animals talk with their bodies, not in English, right? We can teach them some basic associations and they can respond after they learn those associations. However, they come pre-programmed with a lot of stuff too. Body language, what does a wagging tail mean? Yaya, do you know? What does a wagging tail mean? Christina, do you know? What does a wagging tail mean? Elizabeth? I'm sure, come on. If I told you a dog was wagging his tail, what does it mean? Elizabeth says happy or anxious, depends on how. Okay. Happy or anxious. Anybody else have some feedback to put in there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it says something. <laughs> yes, yes, something, absolutely something. <laughs> Okay, so you're on the right track, Beth. You are on the right track. So when a dog is wagging their tail, it depends on the situation. Um, so let me give you a quick rundown on dog tail wagging, okay? There's different, first off, there's different positions the tail can be in, okay? Your, your dog's tails can be neutral. Wait a minute, do I have a fake dog here? I do. Uh, yeah, let me, let me grab Ruben. I'm going to get to my little helper. I'm going to show you dog tail positions with Ruben, okay? All right. So, this is Ruben, my little doggy helper. Okay. I would describe Ruben's tail right now as neutral, okay? It's because it's even with his body. All right. Now you can also have an erect tail, which looks like this. And some dog tails can get very, very high. Okay. You can also have a very low tail, which looks like this. You can even have a super tucked tail, which looks like that. Okay. Now the position of your dog's tail is really going to help tell you how your dog is feeling. Oftentimes when dogs' tails are held up high, they are alert, okay? Oftentimes. So if your dog is standing up nice and tall, they're staring off in the distance, their tail is up just like Reuben, that could mean that they are just very, very aroused, okay? Complete with tail wagging, that can mean they're just aroused. It just means that there's a lot going on. They can be excited, they can be overwhelmed, they can be overstimulated, right? It doesn't necessarily mean they're happy, but it can also mean aggression. Dogs that are about to bite, they can wag their tails really fast too, okay? So wagging doesn't mean happy, it can mean aggression, over aroused, it can mean, well, usually anxious is way down here, right? But sometimes they can wag their tail while it's way down too, which again, that, that would be anxious. So dogs, tail wagging doesn't mean happy. Okay, depending on the situation, it can mean you want Reuben, don't you? You like unstuffing stuffed toys. <laughs> Hope is giving me a very hopeful look down here. I'm gonna put Reuben away, cause she, you will, you will play with him and you will unstuff him, I know. Um, so that's what I'm talking about. It's much more subtle signs that owners don't pick up on, 
And it becomes extremely, extremely important when you're trying to train a service dog. And again, if you don't know body language, you're going to give up because your dog's going to, you and your dog are going to hit a roadblock and you're not going to understand how to backtrack and how to get out of there. It's because you don't know body language. You don't know ethology. You don't know behavior theory, right? Can you get by with just doing and just knowing training? Yeah. Does your percentages of success decrease? Absolutely. It's not just about the training. It's about knowing the stuff behind you. Or you could hire somebody that knows these things as well and can get you through as you're going, right? Okay, but I do strongly recommend for you to educate yourself as well. And again, I have these resources available to you in the group, okay? So what is ethology? Ethology is the study of an animal in its natural habitat. Well, dogs don't have a natural habitat, right? They don't roam free in the wild. There aren't Labradors roaming free in the wild, right? That doesn't happen. Okay. And um, ethology is, again, being the study of natural behavior in the natural environment, you can still play pretend ethologist in your home, right? Just watch and observe your dog. Ask, why did they do that? Right? You can take an ethology course that can help you. <laughs> that can help you through these steps so that you can start better understanding your animal, okay? It's a lot of observation. It's really nice. If you just like watching animals, ethology is the field for you, okay? Um, tracking behavior progress, we, we mentioned that earlier. So not only are we talking about practicing behaviors steps for your dog, right? Because we touched on that earlier in the broadcast, but we're also talking about Tracking your behavior progress. What kind of habits have you been able to put into motion? And if you click that link at the bottom of the PDF, there are some habit books that I strongly recommend that I've read myself and that I keep re going back to when I need to have a reminder about how to get a, a habit that I need to be forming in. Hi, Bibi. <laughs> She's super boring. Um, so yeah, like those are the kinds of things you need to know. And of course, applied behavior analysis, which is behavior modification. So of course, here we go. We covered this real quick. Again, there's a note down here. Check the file section in the group to download your free PDF for your suggested um, book reading. And now we have our fantastic action step. How have you guys been doing with your action steps? Have you been able to answer them all? Or have you at least been able to start thinking about them and maybe start putting them in motion? Maybe you've started to research puppy culture a little bit more. How have you guys been doing with the action steps? Have you been seeing them in the group? I've been posting them every day. How have you been doing? Okay, so today's action step. How will you keep track of your dog's progress? Again, this is a thing that goes over two years, right? You have a lot of time, but you don't have a lot of time. You have to keep pushing forward every single day. How are you gonna keep track of it? So for me, I, I personally have my own behavior tracking chart. I've made so many behavior tracking charts, it's second nature to me, okay? I know about things, I can keep going, I, under, I remember where I was, where I'm trying to go, and where I'm at, right? But if you guys are not so good at that, maybe you have some ADHD, I have ADHD, but I have, I have been perfecting and working at this for years, okay? I, mm, I have done so much self butt kicking in my life, it's insane. Um, Yaya says, it's interesting how small things make such a huge difference. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Beth says, good on the action steps. Awesome. That's great to hear. So, all right. How are you going to keep track of your dog's progress? I like to keep a yearly, quarterly, monthly, weekly, daily calendar. Okay. And I like to update those regularly so that I know where we, where we're going. Okay, and I like to adjust where we're at because sometimes my dog is going to really get something and we can skip ahead to the next thing. And sometimes my dog's going to be a little bit slower and we're going to have to take some more time on those behaviors. Okay, so that's your action item. Um, what you can do, let me give you a little hint, right? You can actually go online and search for free um, habit trackers. 
And if you go and if you purchase, I believe it's The Power of Habit, if you purchase James Clear's book, The Power of Habit, he actually has free downloadable forms on his website for people who have purchased the book. And you can just have your habit tracker right there. You can put it on your fridge every day. You can put it on your bathroom mirror, wherever it is, you're gonna see it every single day. And you can mark it off and do your squares and fill in your squares, which funny enough, there's been research done about habit tracking and if you're people are more likely to complete a habit if they are told they have to fill in a square completely black versus just writing a check mark in it isn't that interesting isn't that interesting so I started doing that and it is true it's very true where you are much more likely to be able to do that okay so and of course, if you guys are ever feeling stuck or overwhelmed, feel free to reach out to me. I'm here for you guys. If you have questions like what are your next steps? Yaya, yeah, I know. What did you get your puppy today or is that tomorrow? I don't know. Let me know. Um, but yeah, it makes it makes a huge difference. OK, so thank you guys so much for joining me. Join me again tomorrow. And I want to remind you guys, invite, invite, invite people to the group, because if you want to win this book, I need to be knowing that you guys are inviting people and I will ship it to you directly. You can have, don't shoot the dog on yourself. And this, by the way, this is on the re recommended lead reading list. So if you want to save a little bit of money, if you want to be a step ahead of the curve and you want this book, make sure to start inviting people to the group and make sure to let me know who you're sending or at least send them, send them over, invite them, invite them together with a Facebook message okay put put us together in the chat and just say hey you know here she is this is the person i'm talking about say hi right just let me know yeah yes it's closer to being 10 weeks old okay i mean and that's fine 10 weeks is a fine age to start at elizabeth says the more senses you involve in habit formation the more successful you will be yes absolutely 100 percent. you know if you know you know right if you know you know that's awesome thank you christina yeah you're absolutely welcome i'm so happy to have you here i want to see you guys again tomorrow at 12 o'clock can't wait to see you guys there and um have a great rest of the week all right bye guys